fine tuning does not imply a fine tuner. And Dr. Craig, this is an article that I think kind of took you by surprise. It's by Hans Halverson, who's in the Department of Philosophy at Princeton. He says, some think fine tuning is evidence for God, but in fact, the opposite is true. Why did this take you by surprise? The reason I'm surprised is that Hans Halverson, whom I know personally, is a brilliant philosopher of quantum physics, and therefore I'm surprised that he would find these arguments persuasive. It almost seems as though he's not familiar with the best statements of the argument from fine-tuning for a designer, such as are offered by Robin Collins and Luke Barnes. And so I'm, I'm puzzled that he would think that these objections he raises are insuperable. About the middle of the page, he identifies or defines the fine-tuning argument. He says, the fine-tuning argument rests on an interesting discovery, a physical cosmology, that the odds were strongly stacked against life. This new fine-tuning design argument claims the imprimatur of physics and is presented in quantitatively precise terms. Among the set of all possible universes, the percentage that could sustain life is so small that the human mind cannot imagine it. By all rights, our universe shouldn't have existed, but what wonder that our universe has given birth to life, especially intelligent life. It seems the only explanation for this wildly improbable outcome is the supposition that there is a designer, capital D. But could it really be that physics points to God's existence? This is a popular statement of the argument. It's imprecise, it lacks rigor, but I'm not going to quibble with it. Mm. Um, we'll get into the more precise formulation of the argument as we proceed. So let's just accept this uh, to get the conversation started. He says, let me put my cards on the table. I believe that our universe is the creation of an omnipotent being. And I agree with John Glenn, who said, looking at the earth from this vantage point, looking at this kind of creation, and to not believe in God, to me, is impossible. But the attempt to parlay this sense of wonder into a scientific proof is fraught with danger, and the fine-tuning argument is no exception. This is interesting. He seems to think that belief in God is a properly basic belief that is grounded in this sense of wonder and awe at the universe, but that when you attempt to express this as an argument, then he, he's going to find that problematic. So I take it that for Halverson, belief in God is a properly basic belief. Indeed, he, he says it's impossible not to believe for him, uh, grounded in um, one's experience of the universe, but, but one can't uh, uh, formulate an argument for God's existence that would be a sound argument. He continues, there is a deep problem lurking in the background of the fine-tuning argument, which rests on two factual claims. One is that a life-conducive universe exists. Now, here we have to begin to quibble. Um, the fine-tuning argument, as usually stated, does not assert that a life-conducive universe exists. Conducive means apt to produce something, mm -hmm. uh, that life would be more probable than not, um, given the way the universe is. And that's no part of the fine-tuning argument. Rather, the fine-tuning argument is usually stated by people like John Leslie and others is that uh, a life-permitting universe exists. The fundamental constants and quantities of nature are such as to permit the origin and evolution of embodied conscious agents in the world. So uh, it, it isn't a part of the traditional fine-tuning arguments that a life-conducive universe exists. He says the second is that this kind of universe is improbable. Now again, this is a problematic statement. If we're going to be doing a rigorous argument here with probability arguments, they are always relative 
to background information. Improbable with respect to what? Um, and here, the proponents of a fine-tuning argument will say that the fine-tuning of the universe is improbable relative to naturalism or relative to a single atheistic universe, but that relative to theism, the fine-tuning is not improbable. That when you look at the ratio between fine-tuning relative to naturalism compared to fine-tuning relative to theism, that the fine-tuning is vastly, vastly more improbable on naturalism than it is on theism. So there is no sort of absolute claim that fine-tuning is improbable. It's improbable with respect to certain background information. Indeed, the way Robin Collins formulates the argument, he doesn't even calculate the probability of fine-tuning. Rather, he argues that embodied conscious agents are vastly more improbable with respect to a single naturalistic, atheistic universe than they are relative to theism. Given theism, uh, it is more probable that embodied conscious agents would exist than it is on an atheistic single universe hypothesis. Okay. And Bill, he says that it's the second fact that is responsible for the resurrection of the design argument. Uh, do you think that's case, it, uh, the, the case because it has come roaring back? Uh, oh, yes, discovered. yes. Oh, I do think that it is the improbability of the fine-tuning on naturalism uh, that has helped to promote this argument uh, and to make it a common topic among physicists today in journals, at scientific meetings, uh, in an attempt to try to find the best explanation for why our universe exhibits this uncanny fine-tuning for life. Okay. And what he says is that uh, fine-tuning advocates are so focused on using this second principle as a premise that they fail to see that it needs explanation. That is, why is it the case that it's unlikely for an arbitrary universe to be conducive to life? Now, you? here is, again, one of these places where I'm, I, I'm baffled. I think, have you not familiarized yourself with the literature on fine-tuning? Of course the advocates of fine-tuning um, are seeking an explanation uh, of why it is so improbable. And the idea here is that the... Um, assumable range of values for these constants and quantities, that is to say the values they could have consistent with the laws of nature, is so vast compared to the range of life-permitting values that they are, that, that it makes it enormously improbable that a life-permitting universe should exist. A dart randomly thrown at the range of values would in all probability, strike a life-prohibiting universe. Um, the range of life-permitting values is practically infinitesimal compared to the range of assumable values. And so a randomly thrown dart would take one of these values that is a life-prohibiting universe. And it's in that sense that it is enormously improbable relative to naturalism that a fine-tuned or life-permitting universe should exist. He continues, that is, why, why is it the case that it's unlikely for an arbitrary universe to be conducive to life? It's not plausible to write it off as a brute necessity because it's not obvious that this had to be the case nor could it have been discovered by pure reason alone. All right. So what alternative is he excluding there, Kevin, as an explanation for the fine-tuning? Pure reason, you know, is not, not anything that can be... Yes, but among the three alternatives that we typically discuss in dealing with the fine-tuning argument, this is the alternative of physical necessity. Physical necessity. And he's saying, yeah. he agrees, 
that it's not plausible to explain the fine-tuning by physical necessity. So that means if he's going to deny design, he's going to have to advert to the chance hypothesis. Here he says, but even if we do find the much-needed explanation, it will be disastrous for the fine-tuning argument because it would disconfirm God's existence. After all, a benevolent God would want to create the physical laws so that life-conducive universes would be overwhelmingly likely. Now, this is a shocking claim on Howerson's part. In fact, I, I think it's crazy uh, to assert this. Why does he think that if God exists, that God would create a universe um, in which fine-tuning is probable on naturalism? I can't think of any reason God would do such a thing. Why not create a universe in which fine-tuning is probable on theism, but improbable on naturalism? Maybe God wanted to leave evidence of his existence. And so by creating a universe that in all probability would never have evolved life if God did not exist, God has left remarkable evidence of his existence in nature. So I find Halverson's claim here to be just bizarre that he would think to know um, what God would do about this. This is what Kevin Sharp, in my dialogue with him um, at Ohio State University a few years ago, called divine psychology. <laughs> And Halverson um, is indulging here a little bit of divine psychology in saying that if God existed, he would create a universe uh, in which the in which the fine tuning would be highly probable on naturalism, which I think is nuts. He says the fine tuning argument rests on an interesting discovery of physical cosmology that the odds were strongly stacked against life. But if God exists, then the odds didn't have to be stacked this way. These bad odds could themselves be taken as evidence against the existence of God. He's right that God is at liberty to create any sort of universe that he wants, uh, a finely tuned universe or a universe that is not finely tuned. But the fact that um, the odds would be stacked against life given naturalism is not in any way a disconfirmation of God's existence. On the contrary, as I explained, it would actually be evidence of God's existence, um, that a universe exists which is so enormously improbable given naturalism, but not improbable given theism, since, as Halverson says, God is at liberty to create the, any sort of universe that he wants. He says, I myself don't think that the extreme improbability of the existence of life disproves the existence of God. Okay, now here he's, he's entering a caveat. He's withdrawing what mm -hmm. he asserted yeah. before. He, he said that this is disconfirmation of God's existence, that the fine-tuning is so improbable on naturalism. Now, let's see why is he ready to withdraw this claim now. He said... But that's because I don't think we understand God well enough to make firm predictions one way or the other about what kind of universe God would create. This is Kevin Sharp's point about divine psychology. What God would do. Yeah, how, how do we know what kind of universe God would create um, if he exists? But that actually serves to undercut Halverson's argument, I think, because while you can say that embodied conscious agents are highly improbable on naturalism, you can't say they're improbable on theism, precisely because you can't do divine psychology. There's, uh, there isn't any way that you can assert that this is highly improbable. He, he wraps it up by saying, one could go too far with this sort of skepticism. Surely the so-called fine-tuning evidence is proof of something. But the fact that our current cosmology theory can't explain it tells us that we have more work to do when our best science predicts a lifeless universe and this fails to obtain, what should we do? 
We could say, a miracle has occurred, but that would be intellectually lazy. We need a theory that will make accurate predictions and integrate with other successful physical theories. The fine-tuning argument falls short because it assumes that our current cosmological theory is correct as long as we invoke a, as long as we invoke a non-scientific principle, God. I advocate a more radical and scientific reading of the fine-tuning data. It's not a brute fact or a true premise in a theological argument. Rather, it's evidence that we need a new and revolutionary cosmological theory. Wow. Okay, so here's Halverson's alternative to design. It is that we need a new and revolutionary cosmological theory. He's advocating for some sort of fantasy physics that we don't have that would apparently render the fine-tuning physically necessary, that would make it not due to chance, but according to physical necessity. And this is a fantasy. There, there is no such physics. So this is a profoundly, I think, anti-scientific alternative. It's rooted in a kind of methodological naturalism that says there has to be a scientific explanation for fine-tuning, uh, even if that requires a thoroughgoing revision of contemporary astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, I think that theism is certainly uh, a viable alternative to that. Mm -hmm. Notice that theism is not proposing some sort of alternative cosmological theory, as he recognizes. Theism assumes that the current cosmological theory is correct. And as to the best explanation of the fine-tuning, you could regard that, as I'm inclined to do, as a philosophical question, not a scientific question. I'm not proposing a new scientific theory to replace the current cosmological model. I, as a philosopher, am asking a metaphysical question that scientists are free to simply say, we don't have an explanation for this. Um, we don't know what explains the fine-tuning. Um, this is not a scientific question, they might say. Uh, or if they come to a scientific dead end, they might just throw up their hands. But to offer some sort of a fantasy physics as an alternative to theism, I think, is desperate. Yeah. And Bill, I wonder if he's, if he's afraid of God of the gaps. In this whole thing. Yes, that seems evident, the way he characterizes it. We could just say a miracle occurred, mm -hmm. when in fact the proponents of the fine-tuning argument, like Robin Collins and others, um, are offering an argument based upon confirmation theory, probability calculus, and saying that the fine-tuning of the universe or embodied conscious agents uh, are much more probable on theism than they are on atheism, and therefore uh, these lend confirmation to the hypothesis of theism over atheism. 